Anxiety can stop you from living your best life. It makes the world seem threatening and dangerous. But if you understand how anxiety plays this trick on your brain, you can learn to transform anxiety into confidence. Now, in the brain, anxiety seems to result from the activity of a network of brain regions, including the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, the insula, the cingulate cortex, the brainstem, and thalamus. And in my last live stream, I took a deep dive into this neurobiology. In this video though, while I'll touch on a lot of these topics, I'm going to approach anxiety from a much more actionable angle. And the way I wanna do that is to talk about a common struggle you may have found yourself in. All right, so let's imagine you have a good job, but there's something else you want to do, a career you want to pursue. And let's say, for example, that you're currently working in, say, marketing, but deep down, what you really want to do is write sci-fi thriller novels. As much as you love writing, whenever you think of it, your brain's hippocampus reignites a painful memory of when you were a teenager. You were discouraged by your parents and teachers. They used to say, don't be ridiculous, choose something more practical. Re-experiencing this disappointment and shame triggers a sense of danger at the thought of writing. Every time your mind veers toward your career, a tightening knot of anxiety forms in your stomach. You feel the effects of the brainstem and the hypothalamus' stress response, triggering the release of adrenaline and cortisol into your bloodstream and readying your muscles for action, as if a serious threat was right around the corner. You try to push the thought from your mind. You stop thinking about the future. You just avoid the mental pain of knowing you'll never reach your full potential. But over time, this becomes harder to ignore. The perpetual sense of lurking danger, of worry, of deep anxiety, makes it hard to focus and sleep or even enjoy the simple things in life. At this point, your brain might be showing a pattern consistent with maladaptive anxiety. Anxiety is a biological mechanism that is supposed to prepare the brain and body to identify and confront potential danger in the environment. But when this mechanism is activated in situations where there's no real danger on the horizon, it becomes maladaptive. In the brain, the pattern can differ from person to person, but in this hypothetical case, let's say your amygdala is showing abnormally high activity whenever the future comes to mind. This amygdala hyperactivity then sends signals simultaneously to at least three other brain regions, which together make for that extremely unpleasant experience. One of these is the thalamus. It's a brain region where sensory information coming from the eyes, ears, and other sensory organs flows through before it gets to the cerebral cortex. So when the thalamus receives a signal from the amygdala, it filters information coming from those sensory systems to search for potential threats while ignoring more positive information. It's like a filter, it makes you uneasy. You're always on guard, especially when you think about your career. Next, your amygdala also sends signals to your hypothalamus, triggering the fight or flight response. Your body seems to always be ready to confront or escape some kind of danger. This is the source of those stomach aches, fast heart rate and high blood pressure that pops up whenever the idea of writing comes to mind. And lastly, your amygdala sends a signal to the prefrontal cortex, or PFC. Now the PFC is heavily involved in our ability to set goals, predict outcomes, plan for the future, and regulate emotions. But in this context, the amygdala influences the PFC to predict that danger is imminent, and then to set a goal for the rest of the brain to be ready to confront or escape the threat. Usually, the PFC can inhibit the amygdala if there's no real danger out there. Unfortunately, in this case, let's say your inhibitory connections between your PFC and amygdala are somewhat weak. And plus, let's say you've been dealing with anxiety since you were a teenager and you haven't learned many coping skills. So year after year of activating this anxiety circuit has only strengthened its synaptic connections. Now, one morning while driving to work, let's say you're listening to an interview with one of your favorite authors, the late Michael Crichton. He's the author of Jurassic Park. And Crichton was talking about writing and he said, I don't feel in any way that I have natural abilities. At that moment, it was like a light bulb turned on in your brain. If Crichton could become a best-selling author through disciplined practice, 
Why couldn't you? This thought seemed to somehow overpower your persistent anxiety. It gave you a jolt of energy as the possibility caused a release of dopamine in your brain. For the next week, you wrote every morning before work, trying to craft engaging stories and build an idea for a book. But soon, you hit a wall. One morning, you noticed while writing that your writing just wasn't as good as your favorite authors. The stories weren't as interesting, let alone thrilling. You began to doubt Crichton's claim about not having any innate talent. Your dopamine-fueled motivation quickly devolved into stress-fueled self-doubt. Now, research shows that in the context of emotional arousal, high dopamine levels, which correlate with one's level of motivation, can make it even more difficult for the PFC to downregulate the activity of the amygdala. So your anxiety returns with a vengeance. You stop waking up early, preferring to avoid the whole subject of writing. You think, it doesn't matter anyway. Nobody would want a mediocre thriller by an unknown author, would they? As you begin to feel purposeless, your brain reignites its familiar pattern. The amygdala, hypothalamus, thalamus, insular cortex, and prefrontal cortex are all working together to make the future feel dangerous and any effort on your part appear futile. You're exhausted, always on the edge of an emotional meltdown. After about a week, you begin to worry that you might feel this way forever constantly on edge, scared, worried, stressed, purposeless, anxious. You know you need help. If you couldn't be a writer, at least you could stop being so stressed and worried all the time. So the next day, you decide to sign up for an online therapy service, and soon you're paired with a therapist specializing in anxiety disorders. Together, you and your therapist quickly identify the main source of your anxiety as a fear of failure you gradually see that you have a tendency to catastrophize. You often predict the worst possible outcome based on flimsy or no evidence at all. You work together to change your thinking about the future. Your therapist encourages you to write down the worst possible case scenario, what you would do if that happened, and then consider what the most likely scenario actually is and how you would deal with it. You gradually come to realize that many of your worst fears were actually based on a misperception of reality being more dangerous than it really is. In your brain, your prefrontal cortex was beginning to take greater control over your amygdala and its influence on the thalamus, allowing you to see things more realistically and less negatively. During this time, you also worked on fostering a growth mindset, seeing failure as a route to success rather than a dead end. You reflected on the many times in your life that you had overcome something that had once seemed impossible, or when you bounced back from a painful loss and became a stronger human being as a result. Recalling memories of triumph and growth instead of anxiety and fear, making the idea that you could be resilient a concrete reality. Now, in addition to addressing these distortions in your thinking, your therapist teaches you mindfulness meditation to train your mind to be calm even when things around you get a little crazy. You practice every day for 10 minutes by simply focusing on your breath and gently returning your attention to your breath every time it strays. This helps strengthen the connection between your prefrontal cortex and amygdala, as well as soothing your body, all of which help to calm the hyperactivity of your insular cortex and its mapping of your bodily sensations. Additionally, you also learn breathing exercises to help immediately calm your body by shifting from the fight or flight to rest and digest. For example, the physiological sigh is an evidence-based method of rapid relaxation where you take a fast double inhale through the nose, then a very slow exhale through the mouth, and repeat that a few times. This takes advantage of the diaphragm's influence on blood flow through the heart, helping to dramatically reduce the activity of the sympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for the fight or flight stress response. All this was vital, but the most important part of your therapy came when your therapist encouraged you to do what scared you most, but which would ultimately be highly rewarding. Together, you made a plan to face your fear of failure by committing to writing your novel and trying to get it published. At first, this task seemed like an exercise in masochism. After all, what if you were rejected? Wouldn't it be better to just avoid it and stay safe? That worry revealed something else you needed to work on, the source of your motivation. With your therapist's help, you asked what motivated you to be a writer in the first place. 
For a long time, you had been so focused on external rewards, like being a rich and famous author and maybe proving your parents wrong. You had almost forgotten how much you love the act of writing the stories themselves. This prompted you to learn about the concept of intrinsic motivation. That's the kind of motivation we feel for things that we simply love to do for their own sake. This kind of motivation is much more sustainable for the brain compared to extrinsic motivation, like money or social approval. This turned out to be a revelation. You understood now that your anxiety arose primarily because you had relied on extrinsic motivation and harbored that deep fear of failure and sense of shame about who you were inside. But it was also because you had never learned how to effectively calm your mind and body. And now you had tools to address all of these issues. Now, maybe you relate with this story, but perhaps you noticed that this hypothetical you never really failed, right? Maybe you're thinking, okay, that's great, but I've experienced failure so many times that I really don't have any hope left for the future. Maybe you don't feel anxious as much as helpless, hopeless, or depressed. Like there's just nothing you can do. If that describes you, I first wanna just say I'm sorry and I empathize with you. I felt that way more times than I care to remember. But the truth is that there is an emerging area of neuroscience that studies human resilience in the face of adversity. Interestingly, it seems to have a lot to do with the neural pathway going from the prefrontal cortex to an evolutionarily ancient area of the brainstem where serotonin is produced called the dorsal raphae nuclei. And most importantly, the research indicates that just like the pathway from the PFC to the amygdala, we can take control of this other pathway and strengthen it. But the question is, how do you do that? And you can find the answer in this video right here. All right. Thanks so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.